This is Olga, and this is Check It at the Roundtable, where we discuss movies, books, music, and stuff. Today, we are discussing a bit of a difficult topic. And the reason we're discussing, discussing this, discussing, discussing this topic, I don't know. I didn't think discussing. It's like discovering with scuffs. Oh, I it's a new word. Okay. Anyway, the reason we're discussing this topic is I think there is a kind of intrinsic relationship, as it were, in many ways with the rise in popularity for BL drama and the fact that we are having, over the past few decades, at least spoken about, there is a great rise in sexual abuse. Now, the connection between these may seem a little odd in many ways, and I'm not saying like I'm not saying that BL dramas depict sexual abuse. That's not it at all in their relationships. What I'm saying here is that I think there is a connection between the fact that many of the BL dramas, the characters' backstories involve sexual abuse. Their current relationships typically do not. Now, of course, there are some that do, and I'm, I'm not really going there. I'm just saying. So what is my point? Well, there were several, but the point that I'd like to make is like, for example, in the series, which I have never reviewed, but I have seen some clips from, Tharn Type, which is like one of the first BL dramas that was ever made, I would like to say, you know, there is the significant issue with that series of Type, who was very sexually abused as a child and him having to deal with that and try to process that as a person in college and also with his relationship in regards to Thorn, I think that plays a pivotal role in many ways with their relationship and also why he ended up being with Thorn because I think he finally met someone who kind of understood him. Now, I will say there are a lot of dynamics to that story that I do not like at all. Um, mainly, I don't think we should ever start relationships as friends with benefits. It is open to a lot of problems in general. But my point is, is the the main way that type saw the world and why he reacted so with such volatility in many ways to Thorn when he first met him was simply because of the abuse that he had experienced in the past and how he hadn't been able to process that. I think it's interesting oftentimes how if we don't find a way to deal with something when it happens, we often have to deal with it later on. And the people who come into our lives oftentimes to help us process that. No, not that everyone who comes into our lives to help us process things is the person that we end up with. No, not at all. I'm simply saying, I think that the universe, as it will, puts people in our paths to help us process things. So we have Tharn type. We also have such things as the most recent one I can think of, which I'm not sure I'm going to be reviewing this one because I personally think it's it's kind of a weird mixture. I mean, no offense, I kind of have the same feeling about this series as I have about um, the Cutie Pie series, which there are aspects of the Cutie Pie series which I really like, except the name Sex Brick, I'm sorry, but it's just way too um, cutie. Yeah, why call it Cutie Pie? I'm just saying. Anyway, so... There's aspects of that show that I, or series that I really did like, mainly the fact that it looked at relationships as a long haul relationship rather than like, oh, this is a one night stand situation. But when I go back to the, the series I'm talking about in question, we have the Love is in the Air series. It's currently on Icky Y. And this series is not for kiddos. This series, there are many parts that I'm like, why do we even have to put this in there? And it's really to, like, I was talking to one of my acquaintances, and they also, like, be able to, like, you know, Anna, they're just coming out with these cringy ones. And I'm like, there are many aspects of the series that I have to say are just darn cringy and are, in my opinion, totally overinflated and not necessary. I mean, no offense. I'm not into overly romantical scenes. I think we can just leave some things out. That's his opinion. So this is not a show for the kiddies. However, the thing that I am, I do think is interesting about Love is in the Air is we have Prapai and Sky, and we also have 
I forgot the name of the other two characters, but they're not particularly relevant for this discussion. But anyway, so for Pi and Sky, Sky was a victim of really bad um, sexual abuse in his life. Um, his boyfriend apparently had him molested by other people. I mean, it was just a terrible situation. And for some reason, Sky thinks that that was his fault and that in any future relationships, he has to try to keep people interested in him, that they will leave him, that they will divert, desert him, that they will, you know, just abandon him because they're all jerks. And I will say, I do get Sky. I understand how he got to that logic. Now, I wish that I didn't because I'm like, it's totally illogical the way that Sky thinks. But if you have endured sexual abuse or abuse of any kind, or if you have met people who have endured significant abuse, the one thing that you realize is that it's very hard for those people to know their value. It's like I was watching an Anna Arcana video about knowing your value. And she said, you know, I'm really working on this. And I had to laugh because I'm like, I don't agree with everything Anna Arcana has on her channel, but there is something about her unabashed honesty and how she approaches life that I have to sit there and go, go girl. Because she was doing this video and she's like, you know, I was in a relationship with this person and they said, basically, I want to still be in a physical relationship with you, but I don't want any romantic ties. How do you feel about that? And she said, you know, the old me that didn't value myself would have said, okay, I guess we can do that. And she said, the new me is like, heck no, I am valuable. If you don't see that, okay, but hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> so anyway, but she said, you know, the problem in the lives of many, many people is they don't understand their value. And I think that's the intrinsic thing that I really like about BL drama is the fact that in the ones that I enjoy watching, which are a significant amount of BL drama, the thing that I think is interesting about them is usually the characters that are couples do what they can to build one another up so that the other person realizes their value, not so that they become codependent on that person, but so that that person sits there and goes, you are awesome. And I hope that someday you two realize how awesome you are. And I'm going to do what I can to show you your awesomeness. Not like, basically, they're the pep talk team. And I love that about BL dramas. It's like with, um, with the Purpai and Sky situation. I do not like how their relationships are. I think it sucked Rick, how their relationships are. And when you first meet Prapai, he's one of those absolutely loathsome creatures in Otto's opinion. I have the same feeling about him that I felt about Tom Paris in the initial Star Trek Voyager season one. I just want to sit there and go, you are a waste of human potential. I mean, I rarely feel that way about humans and characters in dramas but when you first meet Prapai I think the the thing that you have to sit there and go is this person has very little to recommend them I mean I know some people think that they're attractive and they're rich and I'm going that might be a draw for some people but if you lack character it kind of deflects all the attributes of having money and looking attractive I mean I remember I was having this discussion with some friends of mine here um, earlier this week and they were like, well, this person is considered very attractive. Everybody likes him. I'm going, that's really not, in my opinion, a good reason for liking this person. I mean, are they a good person? Who, who cares what their net worth is? Who cares what their physical attributes are? If they aren't a good person, why would somebody consider them someone they'd want to end up with but again I see the world very different because I'm a demisexual so I'm like you know that kind of stuff doesn't really make me impressed at all so when you first meet Prapai you're sitting there going he's a loathsome and despicable human being and I will also agree that at the point when you meet Prapai and he's with Sky the first situation you're also sitting there going Sky you're also kind of a train wreck. I mean, I I don't 
dislike Sky as much as I dislike Propai in that situation. But I have to say, both of them kind of kind of a mess. But when you find out what happened to Sky, you're saying they're going, oh my God. The kid doesn't know his value. And because of that, it has led to this terrible cascade effect in his life, which you're sitting there going, this train wreck is completely understandable. It is not completely linear and it is not logical and it is not the way it should be, but you get where Sky is coming from. So with Sky, you have this character who he really is terribly traumatized from his previous relationships and thinks that everyone is going to treat him badly because the previous person did horrible things. And I will just say, you know, that is true. That happened. It's terrible. And the other bad thing about Sky is for some reason, he feels that that was his fault. And he never even like reported that terrible situation to the authorities, which he should have done. But he really thought that he somehow deserved it. And you're sitting there going, honestly, nobody deserves that kind of thing to happen. This is not something that should even be a possibility for people. And so Sky has this situation happen with Papai, and then he leaves that whole thing. He just says, hasta la vista, one night stand, bye-bye. But the interesting thing about Papai is Papai is a total not likable person when you first meet him. But the thing I think is interesting about Papai is he's like, there's something that happened to Sky. And I think it's interesting as you're watching the series, you actually see Prapai, he goes to talk to Rain, Sky's friend, and he goes, do you know what happened between Rain and his previous boyfriend? Because he's like, whatever that was, was probably pretty catastrophic. And I kind of like to know what, what happened because that would help me understand why Sky is so basically like talking to a wall on things. And Rain's like, I don't know what happened with um, Sky's boyfriend. I didn't even know Sky was dating someone. So even though I'm really good friends with Sky, he didn't give me this information. Well, then as time progresses, um, Sky gets sick. And as he's sick, Papai is given the key by Ray, who's like, I will give you my friend's key, but you must promise to not hurt my friend. And you must promise to take very good care of him. And I have to go do my homework because otherwise I'm going to be in big trouble. I do not like Rain's character. He says he's really stupid. He can't really help it, but he is really, really dumb. I mean, yeah, I'm not really into dumb characters. I sympathize with them because I'm like, it's, it's not their fault. They can't help it. They're dumb. But they make really bad decisions sometimes. And they're just, yeah. But anyway, so during the time that Perhai is taking care of Sky. he realizes that Sky is really, really terrified about being alone, being left to himself. Well, things develop. Sky kind of lets his guard down slightly. He also asks um, Perpai over to help him with his homework, and Perpai really thinks something is wrong. So he comes rushing in, and he, there's this very interesting scene where he's like, you know, I know you think I'm just here because I want to be with you for a physical relationship, but I really am concerned about you. So when you call me, I want to help you, but please let me know that you're not like bleeding on the floor because that's what I was worried about when you called this, this evening. And so I think because of that, Sky gradually begins to see Papai in a different way than he had before. Now, I will say, in real life, I really don't see a player like Papai ever giving up his field for somebody like Sky because players don't really do that in real life. I mean, maybe there's some exceptions. You never know. There's always exceptions to the rule. I will be the first to admit that. But I'm just saying in general, having never seen a player quit being a player. But I think the thing with Papai is, number one, he's he's young, he's rich, he has everybody falling over him because he's young and rich and they think he's attractive. Um, but the other thing is he's never met anyone like Sky who 
really is like, you know, you might be the richest person in the world, but that does not mean that I want to date you. That does not mean that I want you in my life in a permanent way. I just really, yeah, I love the scene where he's like, I, I want to know what you like to eat. I like to know this. And he's like, I'll tell you all that in my next life. <laughs> and I'm like, that, that was funny. <laughs> but anyway, with with Papai and Sky, I think this last episode, episode 11, there's a lot of videos on YouTube about Sky and Papai. Not all of them are appropriate, and not all of them showcase things in a, say, in a healthy way. And I will be the first to say, I do not think their relationship started out healthy at all. But the thing that I think is interesting to see as they develop is there is a scene in episode 12 here, episode 12, not episode 11, because it's the before the finale episode. And Sky thinks that Papai was having a moment with someone at a party when really he was sitting there going, I want nothing to do with you and trying to be polite and just get rid of that person. Now, I will say the whole reason that person was there is because Papai had made some very bad decisions in his relationships. If we wouldn't even call them relationships before involving one of these people who he could not even remember, I'm going, you really don't have a good track. But anyway, so because of that, Sky thinks that Papai is cheating on him, like he was cheated on before, and it just triggers this cascade effect in, in Sky's brain where he's saying they're going, oh my god, this is happening again, this is terrible, this is, this is, this is whatever. Triggers, I think, are very dangerous things. I think everyone, no matter whether they've been abused, whether they've not been abused, we all have triggers. We all have a default mold in our brain that sits there and goes, something bad happened to me, maybe even when I was two. Because this bad thing happened, it reminds you of this thing that's happening in the present, and oh my goodness, it could be the same situation again. <gasps> but the truth is, <laughs> If we can step outside of ourselves, which is harder for some of us than for others, and we can sit there and go, there's a bad thing maybe happening right now, but maybe it's our perspective. on it. Maybe this isn't really the situation itself, which is a problem. Maybe the issue is my viewpoint on the situation is clouded because of my past history, and it is not fair of me as a person to put that cloak, as it were, on this situation, because it is not the same situation. It is a different situation that, yes, may have some telltale signs that say, oh, this is similar. And because of that, we should be able to navigate it better, not worse. I think that it is hard to sometimes look at life in a way that we sit there and go, this does not have to be good or bad. It's kind of like, and I think it's Buddhism, they have a basically a saying that says, things are not necessarily good or bad, they're just things. Now, I will say I can't entirely agree with Buddhism's perspective on that, because I'm going, there are some things that you have to sit there and go, those are just bad things, in honest opinion. I mean, I can't sit there and say, this is a good thing. Like, what happened to Sky that triggered all his devaluing of himself that was not a good thing there is no way Anna can ever look at that and go that was a good that wasn't a good that wasn't a bad thing that was just a thing no that was a bad thing but with Sky he is triggered he doesn't even talk to Papai after that situation he actually avoids him for like two to four weeks I don't remember how many and he just says, like, I'm getting ready for a meeting. I've got to go meet with seniors. I've got dinner. I'm tired. And he literally doesn't go back to his apartment either. And at the end of the day, Papai ends up calling him with, he has like three phones for reasons that he probably shouldn't. But anyway, he has three phones. So he calls him with a new SIM card and another number. And Sky says, basically, you know, when you got serious, I just decided I don't want to be with you anymore. And Papai's like, I thought when we were talking in the apartment, you were good with being serious in a relationship instead of casual in a relationship. And he's like, well, I'm not. Well, at the end of the conversation, Papai just throws his phone in disgust. But the thing that I think makes the scene show the development of Papai as a character is like everyone's saying they're going, oh, Papai is perfect for Sky. I'm like, 
Krupai is not perfect for Sky. I don't think that at all. I haven't watched the whole series because some of it, I'm just sitting there going, it's way too cringy. I mean, no offense. It's just not my thing. But the point is, in this scene, I'm sitting there going, Sky needed someone who wouldn't give up on him. And the one thing that Prepai is good at in the show is Prepai is a funny, jocular character. So he seems lighthearted, but at the same time, he is a very driven soul, as it were. It's, I know he drives motorbikes and all that, but I'm just saying he's a very driven personality. And at the end of the scene with a phone call between Sky and Prepai, he's sitting there going, no, this is not Sky. This is not the person who I care about. This is not the person I love. Something is not okay. And I love that scene because he's got tears running down his face, which is like, it's very hard to tell with Prapai how he feels about things because he kind of has this very jocular countenance where everything's happy-go-lucky. But he's saying they're going, no, I refuse to believe this and I'm not giving up on this person. And I think you know that 10 seconds of courage, as they say in We Bought a Zoo, is all you really need to sometimes figure out things. And it doesn't mean like, there have been times in my life where it's like, I have had that 10 seconds of courage. And I can honestly say the end result, it was like, well, I found out the truth of a situation, but that did not make the truth pleasant. And it did not mean that everything went back to happy-go-lucky. Actually, life is never happy-go-lucky. It's always good if you make it, but I'm like, it's not going to be happy-go-lucky most likely. But anyway, I'm like, 10 seconds of courage, it doesn't always mean that you're going to get the answer you want, but it does usually mean that you get the answer that you need for that moment because you had the courage to ask the question. And so Papaya gets up and he leaves. And again, I think this is my favorite scene of all, almost, with Papaya, because he's sitting there and he's going, I know what this person is saying. I know how they're acting, but I also know that something had to happen that was terrible. And because of that, they're acting this way. They're acting like a, like a dog that wants to bite because they've been hit. And there is more to this than I know, and I'm not giving up because I think that it's worth it. And so he goes to Skye's apartment and Skye is at his apartment later that night and he's looking for something. And he hears Papai behind him and go, are you looking for this? And it's a notebook, which I'm not really sure why I did this. I'm like, I don't really know the, the logic behind Skye's action on this, but he wrote down in a notebook that all the qualities that Prapai had that were good. And basically that even though um, that Prapai always knows what he's thinking and that he he likes him because even though she's a narcissist, he thinks that he deserves to be a narcissist. I'm like, nobody deserves to be a narcissist, but anyway. So anyway, but then we get to the part in the notebook where he basically says, um, please don't leave me. Please don't go find somebody else. Please don't, you know, leave me all alone and it's at this point that sky is just literally doubled over in tears on the floor which i don't remember but sky is such a prickly personality that it really is heartbreaking to see him in this situation and propai comes over to him and goes you know i don't and it's and the last thing is like um please say that you like only me and so the other thing that I think is interesting about this notebook is it's in the middle of this notebook that he says, like, Papai wants to know what foods I like, but I want to know what foods Papai likes so I can make sure that we have the foods that he likes as well. And I think the one thing that I really like about Sky is he is, he seems kind of prickly and he seems very difficult in many ways, kind of like the character of Ji Wu in To My Star. But the one thing that overrides all that is he really does have a great heart to be extremely thoughtful and considerate like he's always trying to figure out what he can do to make Papai happy or what kind of food Papai would like or what kind of thing Papai would like to do so anyway but at the end of this um Papai gets down and kind of taps um Sky on the shoulder and he's like you you can't say it because you feel it's unfair for you to say it. But 
I don't like you anymore. And this makes Prabhai just, or it makes this guy just completely lose. I mean, he was losing it before, but now he's like completely beside himself. And also in that notebook, he said, you know, I might be unattractive. I might not be cute. I might not be smart, but I will be my best for you as a person. And Prabhupada looks at him and goes, I don't just like you anymore, Sky. I care about you. I love you. And he says, can you tell me how you really feel about me? Because I know that's really hard for you, basically. And I know that you don't like talking about your feelings. But how do you really feel about me? And it's this point that Prabhupada's like, her sky is like, I, I, I really like you. I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to go away. I don't want, you know, all these terrible things to happen. And Sky and Prapai is going, it's okay. You finally said it. You told me how you feel. I know that was hard. It's going to be okay. And he just basically kind of pats Sky. And I think that is in a nutshell why I did like parts of this series. Because this series kind of like I was talking about in the third type, which again, I'm not sure I will ever review third type because I really hate many aspects of that series, especially the the terrible character in that series. I mean, he was just despicable. I can't even remember his name. Anyway, he sings the theme song, the actor, but I cannot think of his name. Anyway, the one that wanted to be with Tharn and so hurt Tharn's boyfriend. I mean, there are there are a few things that really rile me up, but that was one that I was like, you are just a whore as you would be. But anyway, so in the same way, I don't know if I will ever do a podcast series on Love Within the Air because I'm like, quite frankly, I just wasn't that impressed with it so far. But this scene and those two characters, I thought were very interesting because they really do show in a nutshell how people who are victims of abuse can get into situations that wall them in, as it were. And, you know, I'd like to say this is just fictional, that this does not happen in real life, that in real life, people are able to rise above their abuse and they don't get into these bad situations after that because they had it happen before. So ergo, it should never happen again. But I think that, you know, just because someone had something bad happen and knew the ramifications of that does not mean that they will not have something bad happen again, because oftentimes if they devalue themselves, it leads to them to be preyed upon by people who will continue to devalue them. It's it's one of those vicious cycles. I've even seen it in real life where it's like, You have people who it's, they're amazing human beings. I mean, they have, they're so cool, but they cannot see it because they were hurt in the past and they were told they were worthless. And because of that, it's like, that's all they can hear. And it is so sad to see either in film or in real life because you're sitting there going, everyone's intrinsically valuable. I think, you know, I was taking a walk a couple of days ago and I was like, you know, if you see a human that's being hurt in any way, even if you don't know that person, why wouldn't you go and help them? Because they are a human. They are valuable. They're breathing in and out and just being who they are makes them valuable in this universe. And I was like, why don't other people see everyone as valuable? Because Everyone is. Now, that doesn't mean that some people's like, they might get on your nerves. They might tick you off. They might, you know, bother you. But that doesn't negate their value. It just means they're not maybe the most pleasant people to be around. I mean, you know, but it doesn't mean they're any more or less valuable. They might have some things that make them less attractive to people, but it doesn't negate their value. And you know, oftentimes I think that when people are difficult, it's often because they don't know their worth. And so that leads to them being prickly, as it were. But I do think it's interesting that in many of the 
feel dramas. We have people who have been abused in certain ways, not always sexually. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying sometimes sexually, sometimes because they might have had a dad or a mom who was difficult and very um, hard on them. And we get to see that in these stories. And also we get to see how when people become a couple, they usually build one another up in ways that encourage them. Because I think, you know, a lot of people are like, well, if I, if I meet the person I'm supposed to be with, they will make me happy and I will come to depend on them in ways that, you know, couples usually depend on one another. And, you know, it might just be because dating's never been a big deal to me, but I'm like, even if I did date someone, I'm like, I don't want them to ever come to rely on me to the point that they couldn't be who they are independently. It's like, I think one of the the goals of being in a good relationship of them going, not to be bleak or tragic or anything like that. I'm going, if you are with someone and you decide to be with them for the long haul, then at some point, one of you is probably going to pass away before the other. Not, not to dampen the effect of this podcast. But my point is, is I'm going, so if that is the case, then help them be the people there to be in such a way that even if you are gone, it makes them better, stronger, more capable than they were before. It reminds me of the scene in Supergirl when Brainiac 5 is talking to the female version of himself, who's actually that actor's sister, really cool. But anyway, and the female Brainiac is telling Brainiac about how their partner, she said, you know, when I was with them, I was better and stronger and more person than I was without them because they encouraged me. And they were like, that didn't leave me because they've joined the collective, like the great mind in the sky. I don't know what that is, but anyway, I haven't watched all the series yet. But my point is, is I don't think that love or relationship should ever make us codependent, really. I think it should make us independent in partnership with someone because then we are able to be ourselves but we are able to be ourselves together in a way so anyway I'm kind of curious to see like at the end of this series how that works out because I think you know the one thing I'm not really impressed with is like with the other two characters uh rain and storm I think anyway they're just a chaotic couple. I mean, no offense. I'm like, they're really oversexed. I, I don't mean it bad. I'm like, just really are quite oversexed. But I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying that. So anyway, I try not to say words that might make this not kid friendly, but I'm like, really? This is just over the top. I mean, that's one reason I didn't watch Kim Porsche. I'm like, you know, I think at the end of that, they were a good couple. But uh, the whole Vegas and Pete thing was just totally... That just totally seemed, from what I heard, I was like, this is very disconcerting. Why would you end up with someone who hurts you in that way? And then I was like, they're just, they're really passionate. Anyway, so, (laughs) but I think it will be interesting to see like with, with Sky and with Papai, do they help each other be more of the people they need to be? Because I think with Sky, he really did help Papai be a better person because Papai is like, oh, somebody rocks a rover. They're breathing. I will go be with them. I'm like, you really needed higher standards. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm going, you have really too short of a litmus test for the people you're with. But anyway, but with Sky, I think that Sky helped him to be a better person because the one thing that Papai says in the series is he's like, I've never really had somebody who's made me more consistent and less basically prone to philandering like Sky has. So, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see if Sky also is allowed to see his value in the situation because value is important. I'm going, if you do know your value, you're going to be able 
to be a better human, whether you're with someone or whether you're not with someone. It's kind of like in um, My Tooth, Your Love, the the Taiwanese series that's airing right now, the last episode that was airing. There was a scene between Alex and Vi where um, Alex is like, why don't you go out with the dentist? You, you seem to be getting along well with them. They seem to like you. Why, why don't you maybe consider going out with them? And they're like, well, you know, I can't make up my mind on what I want to do next week. And I'm inconsistent. And I'm, I'm all this. And Alex is looking at him and goes, okay, you're all those things. But YOLO. And I think YOLO. Well, you only live once. So Alex is, I'm sorry, I heard a thump out in the apartment. I was like, I need to go see what's going on. So anyway, so Alex is going, YOLO, you only live once. Why are you thinking about what might happen that's negative instead of thinking about what might happen that's positive? But it kind of is like that in that I think that if everyone, to be honest, probably thought about it, they would probably sit there and go, I maybe shouldn't be with my significant other because they could be with someone way better. But instead they choose to be with me. Because let's face it, if we're completely honest with ourselves, there will always be someone who is better than us, stronger, smarter, braver, whatever. But that does not mean that that person is going to be better suited to be with your person than you are, or that will be better suited to do the task that you do. They might have better qualifications for whatever task you're doing, but that doesn't mean that they will do it better. So I think that if we know our value, it makes us sit there and go, we don't have doubts. We know who we are as a person. We know that we are enough, as it were. And that is something that I think everyone at some point or another probably doubts in their lives because it's like there's so much coming at us that says we're not valuable. Sometimes from the time that we're born, we're told we're not valuable. And it's going, you know, no one should have the right to devalue another human being because we should each have our own value that is intrinsically ours. We don't have to sit there and wonder about it. We don't have to get it from other people. We have it on our own. So anyway, that is a long and lengthy diatribe on real drama and sexual abuse, and it went off into Know Your Value. But I will drop the link to Anna Arcana's video on Know Your Value, because it is a fabulous link. I have to say, it's just, it's stupendous. I'm going, go, Anna. Go, go. So anyway, but I will drop that in the description. Also, if, if you have some recommendations for some other rabbit holes about this topic, I would be very interested to hear from you. You can email us. My Our email is going to be, if you go to our about page on YouTube, because I did not memorize it, peeps. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with that. But anyway, you can definitely check that out and read about it and contact us that way. But I really do think there is a connection because I do find it interesting that we, I mean, and also we do have to admit that, you know, if they had been making BL dramas in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, most people would not have been watching them anyway, just because of the social stigmatism attached to them. But so we do have a more free thinking society than we did back then. I'll be the first to admit. But I also think that there is a connection between the fact that people can relate to these characters, whether you're LGBTQI plus or not, because they have been through similar situations. And I think that oftentimes when we when we watch things or we read things, we like to understand characters that we find relatable, if that makes sense. And that is my very rabbit hole um, review of BL drama and sexual abuse and the connections I find between them. Thank you for listening. Check it at the round table. Bye.